Amen. So in Psalms chapter 6, uh, we'll just get right into it. We're going through the book of Psalm on Sunday night. And it starts out there, of course, this is what, you know, a lot of the theologians and things will say. This is one of the seven, you know, penitent prayers that David prayed throughout the book of Psalms. And, uh, you know, I kind of tried to figure out exactly what it is that he was, uh, you know, beating himself up about here. I really don't know that it's clear. But whatever it is he has done, you know, he has the right attitude in this psalm. He says in the beginning, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. You know, in just that one phrase alone, there's a few things that we can learn. One is that, you know, it's possible to make God mad. You know, God can get mad, uh, you know, not just with the wicked and the unsaved, but God can even get mad with his own children, even a man like David. You know, we know that um, David was not perfect and nobody is. Um, everybody can commit sin. You know, the, don't, don't buy the, the, the line that they're trying to sell you out there, you know, that God is not mad at you. You know, maybe God isn't mad at you tonight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's always going to be the case. You know, we can get out of sorts with God, we can upset the Lord, and we can even, uh, you know, upset Him to the point where, you know, He's going to chasten us in His hot displeasure, as it says, you know, in the he book of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, you know, that He chasteneth every son whom He receiveth, Amen. you know, that we are to not be weary of His correction. And David here, he might have done something, he obviously did something wrong, we don't know exactly what it is. But whatever it is, he has the right attitude. And this is the attitude that we ought to have when we find ourselves on the receiving end of God's anger. Not, you know, getting stiff-necked or hard-hearted and just, you know, digging in our heels, but rather have an attitude that says, you know, chasing me not in thy hot displeasure. We'll go on and see what his attitude is in the psalm, where he's basically pleading and asking for mercy and, you know, availing himself to the mercy of God, which is a great attribute of God's, and we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. So we all sin, even a man like David. You know, nobody is above that. We're known as above reproach. Uh, if you would, go over to Ezekiel chapter 8. You know, everybody sins, but not everybody is sorrow, uh, sorrowful for their sin. Not everybody feels bad about the, the things that they do that upset God. You know, a lot of people move to this world, and they're just, they're just fine with doing things that, that make God mad. People even go so far as to provoke God to anger in their lives. They'll even hear what the Bible has to say about some topic, whatever it is, or some sin, and they'll go right ahead and, 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 and do it anyway, you know, in, in God's face. And uh, <laughs> the point being is that not everybody is sorrowful for their sin, which is not the case with David. He has the right attitude. It reminds me of the proverb chapter 30 where it says, Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. You know, there's some people that are going to go, and commit sin, and they're just going to walk and say, I've done nothing wrong, you know. And again, here's the thing, you know, we all commit sin. You know, I'm not saying that we should try to live, that we're, we should definitely try to live a sinless life, but I'm not saying that it's possible for us to live a sinless life. We all are flesh, we're all going to fall, we're all going to make mistakes, we're all going to give in to sin to some degree or another. Now, we should minimize that, and as we grow in our Christian life, those type of things should happen less and less. And, you know, perfection is the goal. It's just an unattainable one in this life. But what you don't want to have is an attitude like this, of this woman who just commits something like adultery and just wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wickedness. You know, that's a surefire way to get God mad at you real quick, Amen. is to just do something wicked and then not, you know, when you're called on the carpet for it, you know, not admit it. You know, David, when he was called on the carpet for his adultery, with Bathsheba, you know, the prophet Nathan came to him and said, you know, thou art the man, you know, pointed his finger right at him. And what did he say? I have sinned, right? And he just fessed right up to it. He knew what he'd done wrong. That's the type of attitude we have to have when it comes to our own sin. Look at Ezekiel chapter 8, because again, there's some people that, you know, they, they want to tell themselves that they've done nothing wrong. But even in the, in, the, in the back of their minds, they know that they've committed sin. And this is really interesting here in Ezekiel chapter 8. I've, I've mentioned this before you know, when we first started, but you know, I, I, every time I read this, it, just, it, it stands out to me. And of course, this is where the angel's bringing Ezekiel back to Jerusalem and showing them all the abominations that the, that the, that the priests do in the, in the holy place, in the temple. And it says in verse 7, He brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto, the, unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, the door. So he's going through a door or a wall, and then he's going through a door. So it's like he's having to go through all these barriers to get to what he's about to see. In verse 9, and he said, And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So where are they doing these wicked abominations? They're doing it behind a wall. 
and then they're doing it behind a door. You know, they're, they're like doing it in this closed off area. They're not doing it out in the open. And you'll see where I'm going here in a minute. And it says in verse 10, So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So they're literally in the house of Israel. They're in God's temple and they're just worship. They're committing idolatry in God's temple. They're defiling the temple of God, which is a wicked sin. In verse 11, and there stood before me, uh, before them, 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. So they're, they're worshiping these, these false images in God's house. Verse 12, then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark every man in the chambers of, a man, of his, uh, of his uh, Im imagery? So they're behind a door. You know, they're behind a wall, they're behind a door, they're in the dark. It's literally like this, this little smoke-filled room where they're committing this abomination. But look at what their attitude is. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. You know, and every time I read this, I just think to myself, if the Lord doesn't see you, why are you hiding behind a wall and a door in the smoke, hiding your sin? And what it just goes to show us is that even people who want to act like, well, I've done nothing wrong, they know in the back of their minds that they need to hide their sin from God, which is not the attitude we want to have. You know, we want to have an attitude like David that has a tender heart that says, you know, I have sinned. And that, because that's how you're going to find mercy. That's how you're going to, you know, God's not going to give mercy to somebody who says, well, I've done nothing wrong. You have to be willing to, willing to admit that you've actually done something wrong before you can even begin to have the mercy of God. Amen. And you have to understand, like David does, that you can upset God. I mean, these guys clearly, you know, they, they, they had to understand this to some degree that God was not going to approve of what they're doing. If they're burrowing away in some, you know, smoke-filled room somewhere to commit their abomination and then say, well, God doesn't see, it's because in the back of their minds they know that they're wrong. What they should have done is, you know, never done that to begin with, but, you know, if we ever find ourselves, you know, not necessarily doing this kind of a sin, but if we ever find ourselves doing something that is contrary to the Lord's will, that would be displeasing to God, we should be the type of people who aren't going to try and hide it away. We should confess it and forsake it and have mercy from God. Otherwise, you know what? It's the hot anger. Otherwise, it's, it's the displeasure. It's the chastening of God that's going to come. Amen. Be like David. Have a tender heart. Go over to Proverbs 28. Proverbs chapter 28. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, he's calling them brethren. And he's saying, lest there be in any heart of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, sin in our life has this, this power that we, we, I think, underestimate to a great degree. Sometimes we just think, well, it's just a little bit, little bit of sin. It's not going to hurt anything. Yeah, but sin is deceitful. And a little bit of sin, you know, then it becomes, well, you know, that was just a little bit of sin. A little bit more is not going to hurt. And then a little bit more is not going to hurt. Well, I've already gone this far. I might as well just go all the way. And that is the deceitfulness of sin. And what that does is it leads us down a road to where now we find ourselves with a hardened heart. That's, what, that's the danger of sin, is that it can actually harden our hearts towards the things of the Lord. So now we're no longer walking in faith. We're walking in unbelief. We're, we're, we're as good as an, as an infidel to some degree. We're, of course, we're saved. Of course, we're going to heaven. But we wouldn't be able to, you know, the, the average person wouldn't be able to tell us apart from, you know, just another unsaved sinner by the way that we're living sometimes. That's the deceitfulness of sin. That's what Paul here in Hebrews is warning us about, to not be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What's it going to harden? It's going to harden your heart. You need to be like David in this psalm and have a tender heart. Look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them have shall, has, shall have mercy. Amen. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Do you see how mischief and sin and hardening your heart go hand in hand? How they just go together? How one kind of leads to the other and vice versa? But again, it goes back to the point I just made. That whosoever confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have mercy. Now, that's a great promise that we have from God. You know, and this is one we're all going to need to some degree or another in our lives. We're all going to have to, we're probably all going to find ourselves at some point saying, what I just did, said, thought, whatever, was sinful, was wicked, was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. 
The thing to do in that instance is not to stiffen up and say, well, I'm just going to you know, keep doing it anyway. Because that's not going to get you mercy. You have to confess and forsake. And you know, the forsaking is another big part of that, <laughs> that equation too, if you want the mercy from God. Last time, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and do this sin and then I'll confess it. And then I'm good to go. And then, you know what? And the next day, I'll just confess it again. And then I'm good to go. That's, not the, that's only half of the equation, friend. That's actually what you would call presumptuous sin. To just say, well, you know, I can just go ahead and do this anyway and get away with it. And, and you know, what you're doing is you're assuming on God. You're taking, you know, you're, you're taking God's mercy for granted. The equation is this. Confess it and forsake it. And then have mercy and I don't care what the sin is. Big sin, little sin, and that, that's the wonderful thing about God's mercy and grace is that it's so much bigger than any of our sins. You know, sometimes people do things in life that are horrific. I mean, there's people that come out of rough pasts and they, they look back over their life and they just say, well, I did this sin and I did that sin and they did terrible things that they don't want anyone to know about, but God knows about it. But the wonderful thing is if they just confess that and forsake that, they shall have mercy and be able to move on with their life and serve God. You know, and that ought to be our attitude, too, towards people who have committed sin. You know, if somebody confesses wrong and they, and they, and they forsake that wrong, we should show them mercy, too. Okay, and I'm going to get to that here in a minute. So you've got to have the confession. You've got to have the forsaking. You have to have what David has in the psalm, a sense of sorrow, right? That's what you get out of verse 1. Rebuke me not in thine anger. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. These aren't the words of a guy who has just this shallow passing uh, you know, uh, sense of, of, of sorrow. This is somebody who has a deep sense of, of, of sorrow in his life, who feels bad about the sin in his life. In James chapter 4, I'll just read to you, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hand, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. You know, and it's not just this, oh, I'm going to forsake my sin and just confess it. And, you know, there ought to be, if we're really serious about getting sin out of our life, it ought to bother us, the sin that's in our life. We should feel bad about it. You know, everyone wants the laughter. Everyone wants the joy. And that's there to be had. But, you know, you can't really have the joy and the peace and the happiness that God offers if we never, if we never go through that season of heaviness in our life. You know, if we find ourselves backslidden, not right with God, you know, so I feel bad about it. Good. Good. You should feel bad about it. And that's going to be what helps you get over it and move on with your life and get to the place where you can have the laughter and the joy. But that's what James is saying here. Say, look, be afflicted and mourn and weep. You know, if, if we're backslidden, if we're out of sorts with God, there should be a season of affliction. There should be a season of mourning and weeping in our life where we confess and we forsake. And you know what? The, the, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. You know, but there has to be that, that time that we spend you know, feeling bad about what we've done. Otherwise, you know, have we really confessed it? Have we really forsaken it? If we just don't feel bad, uh, bad about it. David obviously felt bad about whatever he had done. Where he's saying, rebuke me not, you know, chase, don't chase me in the hot displeasure. You know, and, and, and I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact... And it would be great to know, I, I would love to be able to just put my finger on it and tell you this is what David did. But then I kind of think about, well, maybe the reason it's not perfectly clear what, what it was he did, maybe somebody knows the answer, I can't find it, but you know, maybe the reason we don't know exactly what he did is because we'd compare ourselves to that. Well, I, I didn't do what David did, so obviously you know, I don't have to feel that bad about it. But what if David did something real minor? What if David's just beating himself up over something and we'd just be like, that's it? You know? <laughs> You know, and we should never have that attitude, but I mean, not all sins equal. And I think that maybe the reason why David had such a tender heart and why he was able to pray a prayer like this was the fact that he was a prophet, right? And God's prophets are very close to the Lord. And look, that's not an exclusive position. We, we are all priests and kings unto the Lord our God. You know, we, we fulfill that role as well as somebody who's close to God, or at least we can be. And David, being a man that was close to the Lord, Maybe he was more deeply affected by his sins. Maybe the things he did or whatever it was he did, some people might look at and say, I've done a lot worse than that. Are you, really, you're going to beat yourself up over that? But maybe the problem is that those people aren't that close to God or they don't desire to be close to God. Whereas David is a man after God's own heart. He's somebody who wants to be close to God. He's a prophet. He wants to draw nigh to the Lord. 
And that's the thing. When we des- seriously want and uh, have a sincere desire to draw nigh to God and be close to God, what we start to find out, and anybody who's gone down this path knows this is true, what we find out when we start to draw close to God is how sinful we really are. When we start to say, well, I'm going to clean up my thought life. And then, you know, a <laughs> day goes by and it's like, well, I've got a lot of work to do. You know, I'm going to clean up my tongue. And then we find ourselves going, well, <laughs> I've got a lot of work to do. Or whatever it is in our life. When we decided we want to start living for the Lord and walking close with God, like David, who was a prophet, that's when we start to find out how sinful we really are. And you know what? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And that should move us to be afflicted. That should move us to mourn and to weep and to have sorrow over that. Not for the rest of our lives, but, you know, to go through that season. And, and to, why? So that we can obtain mercy from the Lord. Amen. Because you have to confess. You know, that's part of it. You can't just, why, is God a good, God, why would God show mercy to somebody who's not even willing to admit that they're wrong? They don't think they need it. It doesn't make any sense. So we, like David, should examine our own hearts. You know, we should look within. We should pray like David prayed. You know, try me, O Lord, I pray. You know, and know my heart today. You know, search me and, 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 you know, and, and see if there be any wicked way in me. But, to, you know, so often in the Christian life, we get so focused outwardly. You know, we want to start saying, well, what, what's everybody else's problem? Well, you know, what, what is everybody else guilty of? What does so-and-so do? Or what did so-and-so say? Or what was so-and-so? Why aren't they? And whatever. You know, and go on, and we always try to project outward. But really, the, what we need to be doing is looking inward and be more concerned with what's in our own hearts, like David. And if we would do that, you know, we would probably maybe find ourselves praying a prayer like this, like David, rebuke me not in thine anger. Maybe we'd find out we're upsetting God in some way. And maybe not, you know, and we can all get there in life. We can all get to the place where we are pleasing to the Lord. You know, where we would examine our hearts and not say, well, we're perfect, but, you know, we're a lot better than we were. You know, we were a lot better than we were last year, last week, last month, last whatever. Verse 2, we'll move on here in Psalms chapter 6. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, for I am weak. I mean, this is David saying that. David who slew Goliath, you know, with a stone and a sling and cut off his head with with Goliath's sword. I mean, this big, strong guy you know, who fought all these battles, this king is confessing to God, I am weak. He said, O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? And what's interesting here is is the effects that sin have both on body and soul, you know. He's saying there, my bones are vexed, right? That's That's his body. But he also says, my soul is also sore vexed. Now, where is your soul? I mean, can you go to a doctor and have him pull down an anatomy chart and say, there's your soul? You know, your soul is this ethereal thing that we can't exactly say this is it. You know, you can't give medication to the soul. You can't, you know, diagnose the soul. It's a spiritual thing, right? And David is saying here, they know whatever he's done, whatever his problem is, whatever sin he's committed, not only is it vexing his body, you know, his bones, but it's also his soul that has become vexed. So sin affects both body and soul. And here's the thing. A lot of people in life are more than happy to resign themselves to the physical, the negative physical consequences of sin. A lot of people say, you know what? <laughs> I know lung cancer is a reality, but you know, smoke them if you got them, right? A lot of people say, I understand cirrhosis of the liver is a real thing, but I'm going to keep drinking. Or whatever it is. You know, people get involved in some sin and they'll say, you know, I understand there's adverse physical, uh, you know, complications that are going to come from this lifestyle, from this habit, from this sin in my life, but I'm okay with that. You know what? You might be okay with that, but ask yourself this. Are you okay with your soul being vexed? Are you okay with your soul being vexed? I mean, I know Christians that were involved in certain sins that they went and they got saved. They went back to do it and they couldn't do it anymore because it wasn't the same. You know, they just find themselves paranoid or something like that. They're just, the joy was gone. It was vexing of their soul. <coughs> a lot of people today, they, they, they don't consider the spiritual side effects of sin in their life that it's going to have on them, spiritually speaking. You know, we might be fine with, you know, all those things that come along with sin, all those physical things, but what about the depression, the guilt, the shame, the reproach, all the things that come along, the spiritual side effects of sin. 
that vex, you know, not only your bones, your body, but also your soul. I don't think that's a very, I don't, I don't know what, you, you, you know, the Bible says there's pleasures in sin for a season. But you know what's a lot better than that is having a clear conscience of having a soul that is not vexed. I'm not having to do this your whole life. You know, look over your shoulder and, and, and you know, make sure you don't get caught doing whatever. You know, it's, it, that's a vexing of your soul that comes along with that. <coughs> sin affects both sin and body. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. You know, the spirit of a man, you know, people who have a, a right spirit, who are right with God, who have a good heart, you know, who are, are living for the Lord. I've known people like that that can go through great physical, you know, uh, infirmities. You know, some disability, some physical trial in their life. You know, I, I know one person, like, the, the, they, they literally lost their voice just suddenly out of nowhere for, like, months. You know, and they just got it back. And just out of miraculously, it came and went. But this, you wouldn't know it. This person was still smiling and sweet and kind and nice. Yeah, they were a little down about it, but they still managed to live their life. Why? Because they had a good spirit. Amen. Because they were right with God. You know, and you could, and we've probably all known somebody who's gone some, through some, you know, tragedy, some horrific thing that we wouldn't prey on anybody. You know, you know, losing a loved one or whatever, but they go through it with such grace. They go through it with such a good spirit. I'm not saying they're not sorry. I'm not saying they don't mourn, but I'm saying they don't give up on God. They don't quit. They don't let it become an excuse to just throw in the towel on the Christian life. Rather, they go to the Lord. You know, they find themselves drawn even closer to God, and they... They seek the Lord even more, and they're, they're great examples of, of being, what it means to be a Christian because their spirit sustains them through their infirmity. That's what it says there in Proverbs 18. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? You know, it would be better to have you know, your arm broken than to have a broken spirit is what the Bible's saying here. You know, there's a lot of things you can do in life, a lot of things you can put up with in life physically with the right spirit, but if the spirit goes... I mean, if you're already depressed and down and your spirit isn't right and you're already backslidden, you've got all these problems and you know, inwardly you're feeling all this guilt and shame and reproach and then some physical ailment comes along, that, I mean, that could just send you off the rails, that kind of a thing. So we need to be like David. We need to be somebody who understands that sin affects both body and soul and that should, that should compel us to confess to God, to have a tender heart and to seek God's uh, you know, his mercy and his grace. I mean, think about all the sinful people out there that the world lifts up and exalts and says, this is, this is it. These actresses and actors and, you know, the movie stars and the, and the, and the, the, the pop culture and the, and, the, and the, you know, the rock and roll stars and the hip hop artists, all these people that we just, people look at and say, oh, what a great life. They seem to just have, they just seem so happy. Every picture is just, you know, they're just smiling, walking down the red carpet. Everything looks great outwardly. You know, they're the talk of the town. But some, you know, a lot of those people inwardly are some of the most miserable people there are. Amen. How else do you explain the fact that they're, you know, on drugs all the time, in and out of rehab, committing suicide, you know, and their lives just become a mess so often? I mean, how many, how many of those stars do you have to hear about before you get the picture that, you know, the, what, the outward isn't what matters? You know, having all of life's pleasures and things like that, that's not what matters in life. Having a good spirit, having the spirit of the Lord dwelling in you, having God and his blessing upon your life, that's what matters the most. Amen. Nothing else. You know, sinful people, they appear unharmed, but they suffer, suffer inwardly, don't they? Now, in verse 4 there, he says, Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. So David's continuing here with his plea. You know, he's starting out asking not to be rebuked. He's, 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 not, ask, he's asking to be, not asking to be chastened. He's asking for mercy in verse 2. He's confessing his weakness. He's confessing the state that he's in, that he's vexed inwardly, outwardly. And that he says, you know, oh Lord, how long? He knows, Lord, you know, how long is this going to go on? Return, oh Lord. He wants the joy of his salvation to return. Deliver my soul, oh save me for thy mercy's sake. So David, when he finds himself, you know, in this predicament and he starts to cry out to God, you know, he's not really making a demand of God. But what he's doing is he is appealing to God, isn't he? This is all one long appeal. But he's, 
appealing to he's appealing to God by uh, by pleading for mercy, right? That's what he's 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 availing himself to the mercy of God, right? And you know, what, and that, and that's such a great thing to know about God, you know, because we, you know, we're Baptists, we're fire and brimstone preachers, you know, we 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 preach it hard and. And, and, and amen, we should. You know, the Bible's a hard book. We, you know, we preach it all, right? And, but I think sometimes, you know, in certain Baptist circles, you know, sometimes we forget about the mercy of God and just how merciful God really is. And, you know, it, and I'm not saying it's a case for everybody, but if that's us tonight, we need to stop and, and really take, uh, take that into account because God's mercy is probably his greatest attribute. I mean, we could talk about that, and we could probably all come up with different, well, I love this about God, and I love this about God, but you know what I love about God is how merciful he is. You say, well, about his grace, yeah, you know, his grace is great, because I get a lot of things I don't deserve through his grace, but even better than that is his mercy, because because of his mercy, I don't get a lot of things I do deserve. I don't get the chastening, I don't get the sore vexing, I don't get the hot displeasure, I don't get, you know, God coming down on me, why? Because of his mercy. And that's really one of his greatest attributes. And that's why I think in verse 4 that we see David, you know, you know making his uh, appeal by, by pleading and pleading by making his, I should say, making his plea by appealing to the mercy of God. <clears throat> and that's one of God's greatest attributes. Go to Psalm 108. I just want to read a few verses. And look, we could, we could just park it right here tonight and talk about the mercy of God all night long. We could go to verse after verse after verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. After verse. Just talking about the mercy of God tonight. The Bible's full of it, front to back. Let's look at a few verses. The Bible says in Psalm 116, you're going to 108. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Psalm 117, oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us. Why should all nations of people praise God? Because of his merciful kindness that is great towards us. Look at Psalm 108, very famous verse. Psalm 108, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. I love those words. I love that we don't, you know, sometimes I think we get this idea that God is just some mean old man up in heaven with a bat. Just waiting for us to step out of line. That's not God. And look, God chastens. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God is just some big dopey softy up there who's just going to let everything slide because he's not. You know, God comes down on people. God came down on David, not the way that he could have. You know, he, you know the whole thing with Absalom and so on and so forth. But you know what? He, he showed him a lot of mercy. We see mercy all throughout it, all throughout the scripture. And God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide. Now, there might be a time when he does chide, when he gets angry, when he gets upset, when he starts to take it out of, his, out of our hide. But it's not always going to be that way. Neither will he keep his anger forever. You know, we might do things that upset. I mean, you think about how many times the children of Israel upset God in the wilderness. The point where he's just like, I'm going to well, step aside, Moses. I'm wiping him out and starting over with you. And he was that mad. He was ready to do it. And then Moses is like, hey, wait, no, let's, let's think about this for a minute. You know, we don't want the, the heathen to, to, to say you brought him out to destroy him because you couldn't deliver him. And God was angry, but was he angry forever? No, M Moses appealed to his mercy, to his grace at that time. You know, God does get angry. Don't get me wrong, but let's not just think God is always angry all the time. He's just some, some just mad old man all the time. Every little thing we do, just, ah! You know, and this is something that we, this is an attribute that we as Christians need to make sure we are exhibiting as well. You know, I think about this a lot for myself when it comes to parenting. You know, that's kind of one of, you know, maybe I'm just confess a fault a little bit. That's something I'm kind of working on. You know, fifth child just got here. <laughs> no signs of this stopping. <laughs> I'm in it for at least, you know, 18 years of just, you know, Mom, Dad, uh, in and out. He, she, he, bit, spit, lick, just all, you know, people get mad, took my, shoved me, and it just, you know, anyone who's had kids knows that this is, it's, it's like, God. And the next thing you know, you're just like, ah, 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 stop. <laughs> it just starts turning into yelling. You're just angry, right? You know, what we should work on, though, is, is, is not keeping our anger forever. Maybe, maybe try and take the merciful approach. You know, I was, it's funny because I was thinking about this and, you know, I was writing the sermon and last night, you know, I'm, my wife, she's recovering from the birth. She sleeps on the couch 
uh, you know, so she can sit up and nurse the baby. So I'm in the room alone, you know, trying to get some sleep. And, you know, across the hall, all I hear is, <laughs> you know, and it's funny. You can stand a lot of other people's kids crying, but when it's your own, it's just something extra just irritating about it, you know. Because you know how sweet and nice and, and fun they can be, and then you, you, they're like that. You know, you're thinking, okay, what's wrong? Did, did you step in a bear trap or something? I mean, it sounds like, you know, just some tragedy has taken place over there. You know, and they're waking up, in the, and then you realize, you know, my son, he's getting up, and it's like, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night. I'm trying to get to sleep. I've got a long day tomorrow. And I can feel it rising up, the anger. And he comes, and I say, get in here. You know, come in the room. And he's instantly thinking, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble. And, you know, he's four or five, and it becomes instantly obvious what's going on. He's just completely out of it. He didn't eat enough. He's exhausted. He probably doesn't even know where he is right now. You know, he, he's just up in the middle of the night. He's probably in some half-dream state. You know, and I could have gotten annoyed and angry and just, you know, well, that's it. You know, we're, we're going to deal with this. But you know what I said? Son, come here. You know, and he got under the covers. And, and, you know, as soon as he hit the covers and got close to Dad, he was out like a light. You know, and I was just thinking about that. You know, I wonder if God's like that with us sometimes. He sees what we're doing. He sees we're messing around. He's just going, what in the world is the problem? And we're all afraid, oh, God's going to do this. God's going to do that. He's just going to, you know, God's going to take it out of my hide. And God's just saying, come here and shut up. <laughs> you know, come here, get close, just calm down. It's not a big deal. And, and God wants to show how merciful and long-suffering and kind and gentle he really is. You know, and, that's, and David knew it. David knew it in this psalm, and that's why he, that's what he's, he's, he's saying, save me for thy mercy's sake. You know, he's pleading to God's mercy. You know, the, the Lord is ever merciful. It's one of his greatest attributes. Now, we need to understand that tonight, that the, the Lord is merciful and that the Lord's mercy is available to all of us. The Lord's mercy is available to everybody, in, you know, his, his children especially. I mean, God is not willing that any should perish. We understand he wants the world to be saved, but God's mercy is even, you know, how much more so is it available to those that he's bought with his own blood? Amen. It's available to all of us. Now, I will say this. There are some prerequisites to obtaining it. I mean, you see it here with David. He's making this long, he's making this prayer, confessing that he's done wrong, saying, oh, don't be mad. You know, I'm vexed, I'm weak, I'm sorry. And then he pleads to, to the mercy, right? And, and I believe a big reason, we talked about this when we were going to 1 Samuel, a big part of the reason why I think David obtained the, the mercy that he did, especially in his sin with Bathsheba, is the fact that he was one who showed mercy in the past, which is what you see with Saul over and over. You know, we left off in 1 Samuel chapter 24 where David had Saul dead to rights. I mean, he had him in the cave. He could have taken him out. And what does he do? He pursues him out of the cave and lets Saul know, I could have had you. I could have ended your life today and taken over the kingdom, but I didn't. I showed you mercy. And we see that in David's life, that he, you know, he showed a lot of mercy towards Saul. And I believe as a result, he was given mercy himself when he needed it. The Lord's mercy is available. It's one of his greatest art attributes. But who is it available to? It's available to the merciful. Go over to Joel chapter uh, 2. Joel chapter 2. The Bible says in Psalms 18, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man thou shalt show thyself upright. With the pure thou shalt show thyself pure. And with the forward thou shalt show thyself forward. So the Bible's showing us that God, you know, He treats us the way we treat other people. You know, and this is something we need to take note of. And I've preached about this, and this is just something we all need to take note of and all, you know, get through our heads and ingrained in us, is that if we want mercy from God, and if you have any sense, you're going to understand tonight, there will come a time in your life, I don't care who you are, you will need God's mercy at some point in your life. Some of us are going to need it a lot more than others, okay? But everybody's going to need it. Everyone's going to need God's mercy at some point. So how are you going to get it? By being a merciful person. You want slack from God? Give other people slack. Give other, let other, give other people a pass. You know, don't be so quick to jump on other people, especially when it's none of our business. You know, when it's just something that something is going on somewhere else and we just want to get in there and mix it up and just, you know, condemn and whatever. And maybe even rightfully so, maybe we're right about everything we say. But is that how you're going to get mercy, mercy from God? By just being, you know, a forward person? No, you're going to get God's forwardness. You know, we're just going to resist, you know, being a kind, merciful person towards other people. Don't be surprised when God just treats you the same way. 
God's mercy is there. God's mercy is great. But who does he show it to? The merciful. He shows it to the repentant. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Kind of sounds like James, right? Where we read earlier, the weeping, the mourning. God wants us to come back. He says, draw an eye to God. He will draw an eye to you. But cleanse your hands and purify, purify your hearts. Be double-minded. You know, be afflicted and mourn and weep, and so on and so forth. God's saying the same thing here. Turn ye to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. There should be a season of sorrow. And rend your heart and not your garments. You don't give lip service to God. Oh, I'm so sorry for God. Look, God knows our hearts. God knows if you're really sorry about what's going on. So don't try to just put on a show. He's saying, rend your heart, not your garments, and turn on the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So God's saying, look, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I'm slow to anger, I have a great kindness, and I'll repent of every, all the evil I thought to do unto you, if you will turn to me. God's mercy is great. It's his greatest attribute, in my opinion. It's available to all of us if we are merciful and if we're willing to repent. Because again, it all goes back to the fact, why is God going to show mercy to somebody who doesn't think they need it? The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, we all know this, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a great promise from God. But what does it involve? Confessing. Saying, yep, I'm a sinner. I did wrong, but I messed up. And if we confess it and we forsake it, you know what? God is there to forgive it and to give us mercy to give us grace, and we can move on. And I love verse 5. You can go back to Psalm chapter 6. We'll ra start wrapping it up here. But in Psalm chapter 6, he, you know, we can kind of see the motive to get right with God. I mean, some people will hear this and say, you know, that's right. You know, I believe all that. People can get backslidden out, sort of, out of sorts with God and just kind of say, yeah, that's true. I know God's merciful. I know it's there. I know if I confessed my sin and forsook it, that God would be merciful and gracious towards me. And I could go on and, and, and have that, but why should I? But why should I? Why should anyone in the room care about whether or not God will ever show them mercy and grace when they need it? Well, David kind of shows us there in verse 5. He said, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? He's saying, look... If you let my enemies overtake me, if you wipe me out, if you chasten me to the point where I'm dead, look, there's, I'm not going to be able to do anything for you. There's no remembrance of thee. And I know there's a lot of strange Jehovah Witness doctrine that people pull out of these kind of verses, but we're not going to go there tonight. I'm going to keep it on track. He's saying, look, there's no remembrance of thee. This is the motive behind David wanting to get right with God so that he can remember God in all his ways. And he's saying, look, in, in the, at the end there, in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? He's saying, look, if I'm dead and gone, I can't serve you. I can't praise you. I can't thank you on earth. We understand we go to heaven, but David's motive here to get right is so that he can serve the Lord and praise the Lord. And you know what? That's really the only motive that's ever going to compel somebody to get right with God. You know, don't get right because you want to be, you want to you feel good about when, you know, coming to church or the talking to the preacher or you know you just want to i don't know just convince everybody around you that everything's just fine with you get right with god so you can serve him so you can give thanks to him because he's the one that sees knows your heart he's the one that sees you all the time so why not get right with god to serve him why not get right with god for god's sake that was david david's motive there is no remembrance of thee in the grave who shall give thee thanks in the grave David's motive is to get right is to be able to serve God because as we talked about this morning, your days are numbered, the Bible says. And you only have this life to serve God. And that's it. Then it's over. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. He said in verse 6, I am weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. I mean, he's just depressed. He doesn't have the clean conscience. It's keeping him up. He's worried. He's anxious. Look at verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. So David here, 
you know, he's appealing to God's mercy, and he's showing us what real sorrow looks like, and he's showing us what real repentance looks like, and he's showing us the reason why he wants to repent is so that he can serve God. But this, this repentance that he has, you know, has, brings results, doesn't it? It's not just a vain show. It's not just talk, right? There's actual decisions that are being made in his life to show this repentance that he has towards God. Verse 8, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. That's what David is saying here. He's saying, look, I want to get right with God. That way, I'm going to quit running with the wrong crowd. I'm going to quit running with the wrong crowd. And a lot of people need to make, you know, sometimes we all got to, I know I had to make that decision in my life, my Christian life, early on in my Christian life. And it was one of my friends who called me on it. Said, hey, you're talking about Jesus and all this, but you know what? You're doing everything else you used to do. So which is it? And I shocked them because I chose Jesus. And I said, well, if that's the case, then see you later, bud. Because I had enough of that. You know, that's, that's just pain and sorrow. That's, you know, that's like we talked about. That's vexing of the bones and the soul. I already knew that. But David here in his real repentance is showing us that it brings results. Real repentance results in righteousness. Real repentance results in righteousness. Yes, I alliterated that on a purpose. Okay? Because he's saying, look, he's repentant. What is the result? Departing from the workers of iniquity. Getting the sin out of his life. Getting sinful people out of his life. People go, you know, I just can't seem to get the sin in my life. Well, who are you running with? Are you running with God's people? Or are you running with the devil's crowd? Then why, would it, why would it surprise us if we have sin in our life, if we're backslidden and not running with God, when we're not with God's people? When we're not departing from the workers of iniquity? When we're not where we should be? It shouldn't come as a shock to us. <clears throat> and you see, when a person's really sorrowful, when a person really sorrows for their sin, they're going to separate. They're, it's going to lead to separation. They're going to separate from the workers of iniquity. They're going to say, I want to get right with God. I'm sorry, I can't, you know, I can't go to these places anymore. I can't hang with these people anymore. I can't do these things anymore. I want to get right with God. I want God's mercy. I want God's grace. I want God's blessing on my life. Then you have to separate from sin. It's a must. It's, not, it's, it's part of the equation. It's not an option. And that's what David is showing us here departing from the workers of iniquity. Or you know what? You can just stay up all night groaning. You can stay up all night making your bed to swim. You can water your couch with tears and feel bad about your sin night after night after night after night as long as you want. But if you want God's grace and you want God's mercy, separation has to take place. It's just part of the, it's part of the deal. It's a package deal. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. That's a really great ending to this, this psalm, isn't it? I mean, that's what David has wanted this, throughout this whole psalm, to be heard of God. He's crying out to God. He's asking for mercy. He's asking for grace. And he gets it at the end. But it's all these decisions that he made along the way. This understanding that he came to that, hey, sin is going to ruin my body and soul. It's going to vex me inward and outwardly. You know, I'm going to have to separate from wicked people and from a sinful life if I want God to hear my supplication. But you know what the great news about that is? Is that God will hear your supplication. Look, if there's one person whose ear you want, it's God's. Amen. I mean, I don't care if everybody else in the world ignored me. As long as God heard me, I mean, what else do you need? The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. You know, not everybody, and, and this even goes amongst God's people. Because the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. Whosoever despiseth the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Whosoever. <laughs> not everyone can say that they are heard of the Lord, even amongst God's people. Not, I'm not saying God's people can't be heard of God. I'm just saying, God's saying, I'm not listening to that. Because I know what you're up to. I know it's just talk. But when you want to get right, when you want to get real, I'll hear you. You know, not everyone can say they've been heard of God. But David could, couldn't he? I don't think David just made that up in verse 9. I think David walked in and would say, The Lord hath heard my supplication. And he had that peace. He had that, you know, that, that relief that he was looking for in this psalm. It came to him. But it came after the sorrow. It came after the separation. Not before. 
And you know, the good news is that if we would behave ourselves like David, is we can have that same assurance. You know, maybe, maybe we find ourselves in life, maybe not tonight, but maybe sometime in the future we will. We find ourselves backslidden, out, sort, out of sorts with God, you know. Say, oh, not me. Well, boast, you know, uh, uh, take heed lest you fall. It could very, you know, if you think it'll never be you, you're probably well on your way at that point to, to it being you. And if it ever is us, or if it is us tonight, you know, we, we can have that same assurance that David has. That we are going to be heard of God. That God is going to receive our prayer if we're willing to separate from the sin in our life and from the sinful people. And seek God and go through that season of sorrow, go through that season of mourning. That's how we can have the assurance that David has that we are heard of God. Let's go ahead and pray.